A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you. I'm your virtual host, Diksha Rana, and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to this eventful afternoon at 79th All India Ophthalmological Conference 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin with the first session of the day, I would now like to invite Dr. Dilraj S. Grewal to please present their talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. And I would like to thank um, AIOS and uh, Professor Tukumar for the kind invitation to be a part of the ASRS Symposium. I uh, wish we could have been with you in person today, but this is a fantastic virtual platform that's been organized by AIOS. So over the next 10 minutes, I just wanted to talk about some of the techniques that we've used for refractory macular holes. As we are all aware, macular hole repair has really been one of our most successful surgeries that we perform as vitroretinal surgeons. And ever since Kelly and Wendell uh, proposed a surgical closure of macular holes, it's really uh, taken off and evolved. And in that original paper is one of the 100 most frequently cited articles in all of ophthalmology. So there are a lot of approaches, as I'm sure you're aware, for refractory macular holes, and we could probably spend better half of a day talking about them. Um, but over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to primarily focus on more of a plug and scaffold-based approaches rather than ILM-based approaches. So we'll not be discussing inverted autologous or retractable door ILM flaps, but rather focus on autologous blood or platelet rich plasma, macular detachments with subretinal blebs, the autologous retinal transplant, and the human amniotic membrane graft. There's also a lens capsular flap that has been described. I have no personal experience with this, so we won't be covering uh, that in this particular talk. So as you know, uh, Professor Rizzo described the use of the amniotic membrane graft as a plug to close both macular holes as well as some associated macular hole retinal detachments, and even for peripheral retinal breaks. There are various types of amniotic membrane that are available. And uh, these of course differ in the region, but some of the ones that we use here are a cryopreserved amniotic membrane that varies in thickness between 50 to 100 microns. And then two variants of a dehydrated amniotic membrane, one that is about 35 microns and the other one that is thicker at about 50 to 100 microns. And in general, these are composed of an inner compact layer that is comprised of the cuboidal epithelium, which has a thick basement membrane, and the stroma, and this is really the sticky side. And then there's a middle fibroblast layer and now the more spongy layer. So the key in these kinds of surgeries is, as with any refractory macular hole, you do want to confirm adequate removal of the internal limiting membrane. So with the use of dye of your choice, and then instruments of your choice, you do want to inspect and confirm that any residual um, ILM and uh, ERM have been removed, paying particular attention to any fibrotic rings around the macular hole. So we generally use a one millimeter uh, derm punch to create a uh, circular ring off the amniotic membrane and then carefully remove it. And then using a 25 or 23 gauge stroke R system, insert it into the vitreous cavity. Now the key when you're placing the amniotic membrane is you would like to get it in the subretinal space rather than just sitting on top of the macular hole because that is more subject to displacement. Once you have inserted this into the macular hole and you sometimes may need to resize this for smaller holes although refractory holes in general are on the larger size. Um, if you need to resize it, it can be done with the use of intraocular horizontal scissors in, inside the vitreous cavity as well. After the disc is placed, then you perform a uh, gentle fluid air exchange. And this is followed then by the tamponade of your choice, usually um, short acting to sometimes C3FA gas would be adequate in these cases. And then postoperatively, this is what you would like your OCT to look like with this hyperreflective amniotic membrane sitting in the subretinal space and the macular hole closed. Now, the limiting factor here is, of course, the regeneration and the potential for regeneration of the outer retinal cells. And that is something that we are still waiting to see how much um, improvement in visual acuity is possible beyond that that just attained by the closure of the macular hole and, and reduction in scotoma. In some cases, uh, particularly high myopes where there's a lot of corioretinal atrophy, it may be difficult to see the amniotic membrane. And in such cases, staining it with tripan blue is helpful, as you can see here. And particularly if you're using 
the uh, 3D visualization system, like Professor Kumar is going to talk about, you can really use the filters to highlight the um, amniotic membrane quite well intraocularly. Now, it, again, it's important that you are looking for a configuration where the amniotic membrane is in the subretinal space um, uh, postoperatively. And there have been electrophysiologic studies as well that have demonstrated an improved amplitude in such cases. When you're considering a plug-based approach, the key differences to recognize between the autologous retinal transplant and the amniotic membrane graft. Um, one of the issues is that with the autologous retinal transplant, we do see flap integration with linking of the neurosensory uh, layers, um, not in every case, but in several cases. And secondly, manipulation of the retinal graft under peripheral carbon is easier than the amniotic membrane. Um, with the amniotic membrane, one of the challenges is to identify the chorion layer, the sticky side of the plug. And also a key advantage of the amniotic membrane is in cases where there is prior extensive laser or chorion scarring, it's much easier to obtain the amniotic membrane. You also want to tailor your approaches for cases with have a macular hole associated retinal detachment, whether you want to consider doing a staged procedure where you fix the detachment first in the hole at a second time, or you perform a combined surgery with a plug-based approach at the same time. It's also important to recognize that in high myopes, there are some reports of progressive atrophy after the placement of the amniotic membrane, and it's important to monitor for this. Again, they have, the author suggested that uh, adequate placement and the subretinal space would help mitigate this. Another approach is autologous blood or platelet-rich plasma. Uh, we're all familiar with what platelet-rich plasma is, which is basically the Buffy coat. Uh, this is a good source of growth factors, cell adhesion molecules, and it also provides a temporary scaffold. The technique itself has been used over the last several decades, and it's quite straightforward in terms of harvesting blood, whole blood from the antecubital vein, spinning it down for about 15 minutes, and then extracting the supernatant. Um, it's important to recognize that it has to be used within uh, 15 minutes of preparation, so you want to do it at the appropriate stage in the surgery. So you can see here, this is a large macular hole with an associated localized uh, retinal detachment. And then after, during the surgery, again, after you remove the epiretinal membranes you, and you've performed your fluid air exchange and then drainage of subretinal fluid, you're instilling the three drops of this freshly prepared platelet-rich plasma. And uh, that is followed by silicone ions installation. It's important to recognize that if you are using intraoperative imaging, this is what you want your plug to look like with the platelet-rich plasma forming this coagulum rapidly. This is this hyperreflective fibrin plug that is uh, plugging the macular hole. And this is how you should, should look like uh, postoperatively. The ideal configurations will demonstrate a gradual absorption of that plug over the period of about four to six weeks. And you do want it to be um, in extending into somewhat into the subretinal space, we're certainly plugging the macular hole. This is what you do not want to see postoperatively when you're applying whole blood or platelet rich plasma, uh, which is basically a space between the neurosensory retina and the plug, which occurs because of inadequate drying of the retina. It's important to pay attention to this in high, my high myopes with this posterior staphyloma where there may be reaccumulation of fluid. So again, patient drying is critical before you apply blood or platelet rich plasma. Then the autologous retinal transplant, and I was very fortunate to be involved with Dr. Tamer Mahmood for the development of this technique. And we have refined it to the point that it's uh, more streamlined now. So in general, you would want to identify a site superiorly to harvest the graft. This is followed by filling the eye with porphyro carbon that extends beyond the anterior margin of the harvest site. And then using you know, a vertical scissors, uh, pneumatic or manual, you, we are performing a harvest of the graft site extending uh, across the diathermy margins. Uh, this is uh, then followed by applying laser barricade uh, to about two to three rows around the harvest site and recognizing that all of these maneuvers are being performed under perfluorocarbon. And the advantage of doing that is that once your harvest is complete, you can use a forceps and then just slide this graft across the posterior pole and center it in, uh, over the macular hole. This is a key advantage because you maintain orientation of the graft and you are also uh, able to position it much easier over the macular hole under perfluorocarbon. And at the conclusion, this is followed either by a direct exchange or you, um, you can also leave a short-term perfluorocarbon tamponade in for one to two weeks and then remove it. 
the overall closure rate is about 90%, and it's over 95% in eyes black lower rectal detachment. Uh, about 40% of eyes gain at least three lines, 30% gain at least five lines, and 12% actually ended up with 2050 or better vision. The final visual outcome depends on reconstitution of the outer retinal layers, as well as the alignment of the neurosensory retinal layers. And that is really a key feature of the autologous retinal transplant. And these kinds of anatomical um, results and uh, range of visual gains have now been reported by several authors. And this is what you're hoping to see uh, postoperatively. And you can see here that you can see alignment of the inner layers, inner layers of the retina. And then finally, a brief video, and this is Kostrin Meyer's technique. This video was provided by my colleague, Dr. Leila Baizovich, in which they're using subretinal blebs. So you place a little bubble of perfluorocarbon to cover the fovea so as to prevent migration through the fovea. And then you're using this 41 gauge cannula, and you can just place it on top of the neurosensory retina in areas where the ILM has been removed to create multiple subretinal blebs. And that is followed at the end by mobilizing the retina using a finesse loop or a ton of scraper, and then a fluid air exchange. And this technique also works quite well to uh, achieve closure. So in general, there are several different techniques available. Um, I think it's important to recognize that you adopt a technique that works for you because there is a learning curve with all of these. Um, and um, done well, most of these techniques have good outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention. Presentation, Dr. Dilraj. Very nice presentation, Dilraj. Uh, very, uh, you told us all the options for a, uh, the refractory medical uh, macular hole and refractory medical uh, macular holes are really a problem. A headache, how to manage. So uh, we like to do these inverted ILM flaps and you know get the ILM translocation done, and uh, sometimes it does work. But I agree that you're, pay, you're the in, initial innovator of this technique, you and Dr. Mahmood, of your, using the full thickness retinal transplant, bringing it from the side and under the PFCL and guiding it under the hole. But how was the visual, uh, the anatomical results were ex excellent, but what about the functional results, the microperimetry or the, uh, the visual acuity? And so, you know, the visual acuity results, we have good data now that uh, you know, approximately 200 eyes is what we studied and about 40% gain three lines or more. As with any macular hole, your starting vision is the best prognostic indicator of where you're going to end up. Okay. Uh, techniques like micropermetry, it becomes challenging to use it consistently across these cases because oftentimes when you have a lot of atrophy and poor vision to begin with, fixation is difficult. So it's, it, it is uh, right. challenging to get reliable measurements preoperatively to compare post-op. And oftentimes you're relying on eccentric fixation in these cases for the visual improvement. So it, it's difficult to get those kinds of measurements standardized and that's the challenge. In such cases of translocation, uh, do you feel, uh, how long would you like to do the phase down positioning? Of course, you'd take out the PFCL after five days. So if you're doing perfluorocarbon, you need you can do face up positioning. They can just lie supine. And if you're doing a tamponade, then I would at least do about five days of face down, face or chin down positioning. Okay. So you have an option of putting BFCL or not? Yes, you may choose to use it as a short term tamponade, but then you are committing to a second surgery shortly thereafter. So okay, fine. That's nice. Great. Excellent talk. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Dilraj. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Atul, for the amazing comments. Moving on to the next speaker, I would like to invite Dr. Mark. Over to you, sir. Request you to please unmute your lines. Absolutely. Thank Thanks so much for having me. So, let's see here. So I can share my... Uh, my presentation, I guess, when we're right there. Perfect. And so I'll be talking today about endogenous endophthalmitis, a devastating illness that many of us are obviously very familiar with and strikes all over the world, including India and here in America. And 
exactly we'll be talking about how it relates to screening in terms of bloodstream infections. So I have no financial relationships. So essentially this devastating illness we try to look out for, and there's a current practice in mind by the Infectious Disease Society of America that advocates for um, a routine eye exam for, for every patient that has candidemia growing in the blood, regardless of the clinical status. Um, it's one of the most common consultations, at least here in America, um, in the hospital setting. And it's puzzling to many ophthalmologists as to why this might be occurring, because it doesn't seem to match up with the guidelines in some way in terms of how frequently we're actually seeing this, because it seems as if it's quite rare. So looking into where this guideline sort of came from, we were digging back into the literature and in our own American Academy of Ophthalmology Journal, 1982, um, we can see that there is a very high uh, incidence rate reported with patients with candida bloodstream infections, up to 37%. And you can see here in the photograph, uh, three-dimensional view, you can see that there is a white fluffy lesion coming from the macula into the vitreous cavity consistent with endophthalmitis. And so clearly, this is a very high alarming um, statistic to have with someone with bloodstream infection. So with this in mind, it, it makes sense. We would want to find this and treat it appropriately before there was actually vision loss. However, we move forward about 12 years later in a prospective multi-center study um, looking at three different centers here, um, including Duke actually and University of Pittsburgh, they found just looking at strict criteria using NIH Black criteria and using criteria such that vitreous cell had to be involved for endophthalmitis diagnosis, that there were actually no cases of endophthalmitis at three different centers over two and a half years. Now, keep in mind too, this classification also calls for looking specifically at the retina and choroidal lesions as well, and notifying that many of these are nonspecific, including different hemorrhages, cotton wool spots that can be hard to distinguish from chorioretinitis. And many of these findings, as we know, can actually be explained by other underlying comorbidities that are present in addition to candidemia during diagnosis and can actually explain these findings rather than the candidemia. So we move forward about 20 years and the questions are being raised and the data is being replicated. We're not really seeing this endophthalmitis in this setting, in this routine screening. Do we really even need to be doing the screening? What is actually happening? And so questions are arising. Why is there this decrease in endophthalmitis from the 80s and so on? Is are we just finding the candidemia faster in the bloodstream with the, in organisms? Do we just have better systemic antifungal therapy? Do we have better therapy getting into the eye? And most importantly, should we even continue screening? And so what our group did was we had two main objectives. One is to determine the actual rate that site-threatening disease in the city of candidemia is actually occurring. And then two, is figure out what are the actual outcomes of this indiscriminate ophthalmologic screening for candidemia. And so to do this, we looked at all possible studies we could throughout the literature, and we were able to find 38 studies of 7,500 patients approximately looking specifically at fungal organisms in the bloodstream leading to routine screening. And so we go back to this paper in 1982, and keep in mind this is not the only one, and looked at their actual definition of what endophthalmitis is. And here you can see in their definition, they include typical white fluffy retinal lesions, no mention about the vitreous. And in one of their example photographs, we can see here there's a whitish lesion behind a blood vessel. And so at most, this could be chorioretinitis and maybe even just a retinal cotton wool spot, which again is nonspecific and may not even be infectious. There's no evidence here of any vitreous inflammation. As we know here from this slide and others, this is a classic example of endophthalmitis. This comes from the late Dick Green, who's in his eye pathology lab here at Wilmer. And you can see here on this H and E stain, we have clearly budding yeast with polymorphonuclear infiltration extending from the colroid across that purple line showing Brooks membrane into the retina and then vitreous. And this is classic fulminant endophthalmitis. And so this is what we're looking for for our definitions. And so when we're looking at these studies, we decide the criteria to require dental to have that frank vitreous involvement per Newsom Black criteria. And we classify the studies that adhere to this as concordant, or if they didn't, and we're lumping other things along with that as endophthalmitis as discordant. And what was pretty striking was using 1994 as a cutoff based on that study by Donahue et al. 
with a multi-center prospective investigation where they didn't find any endothelitis, we use that as a pivotal date. And we actually found that the incidence of endothelitis was significantly lower after 1994 than before 1994. Um, and furthermore, if you were to actually do a delineation between a comparison between concordant and discordant definitions of endothelitis, it is actually strikingly higher with discordant endothelitis. And in reality, it was actually less than 1% with true endothelitis rates, whereas it was closer to 15 or 20% in those that were discordant. And interestingly as well, even in the cases with true endothelitis that fit the definitions, there were actually no cases of these 7,500 patients that had any intraocular evidence of um, fungal organisms. And so that just goes to show how much of a diagnostic challenge these cases can actually be, even in the setting of candidemia. So what about chorioretinitis? I mean, we know that can be site-threatening too, right? And what happens to the cases of true endothelitis? I mean, certainly if ophthalmologic intervention can change outcomes there, wouldn't we still want to find those? And so we looked at these as well, and we found that over on the left side of the screen, we have our chorioretinitis. And on the right side of the screen, we have our endothelitis. If those that had good systemic management per IDSA, meaning at least two weeks of systemic and immediate antifungal treatment with exchange or removal of, of uh, central venous catheters, actually had success. And if you look in the endothelitis group, you know, they had an association of success with medical management only versus that with invasive management. Now, the numbers are small for this comparison because, again, this is a rare disease to have in this setting. Um, and so the limitations, of course, is they weren't randomized, small numbers, but still, at least there's no evidence supporting that there is an improvement in outcomes by doing the screening paradigm. And so in addition to those findings, there is actually high mortality rates. As we know, patients with candidemia are very sick. About a quarter to a third end up dying within six weeks. And so where are we, where are we missing the picture then? So we look at one of the largest studies to date of culture proven endogenous fungal endothelitis from the vitreous comes out of Bascom Palmer. And what's interesting is only 12% of these patients actually had a positive fungal blood culture. It's completely different than the screening paradigm where we're not seeing any in the vitreous. And so these patients come in with symptoms, they come to the emergency room, they come to the clinic with symptoms. And this is where we're finding the endothelitis. It's not from the screening paradigm. And now the EVS study is a completely different cohort of endothelitis. It's exogenous, it's post-surgical. Um, from anterior segment. And so it's hard to make that comparison, but fungal endothelitis is, can be very devastating, has relatively more than triple retinal detachment rate. And so it's not unexpected that even when we have invasive intervention, we don't have guaranteed outcomes. And something with a screening paradigm, you want to have a good outcome when you able, are able to screen something anyway. So what about changes in systemic therapy? Well, there's this concern that maybe the screening is still pertinent because the kinocandins or a newer systemic therapy doesn't have that great of vitreous penetration. However, this, Spain was ahead of us. They actually looked at this. The, the candy pop study was a multi-center study throughout Spain prospective, and they didn't find any differences in the eye findings of those patients who were on a kinocandins versus those who are on traditional therapies with azoles and amphotericin that traditionally has better vitreous penetration, supposedly. And this makes sense when we go back to histopathology. So this is out of Fuse's lab uh, at, in Los Angeles. And you can see here, the, the typical lesions are in the inner choroid. And so this is part of the systemic vasculature outside the blood retinal barrier. So it makes sense. If we're getting these seeds from the inner choroid, you know, the, it shouldn't matter what the vitreous penetration is if we're getting, again, the underlying cause, which is the Canada bloodstream infection itself. It shouldn't really matter what the vitreous penetration is. And if there is inflammation, the breakdown of the blood retinal barrier should allow that medication to get into the vitreous anyway. And so this is also replicated now with our conventional imaging techniques with OCT. And we can see here where the yellow arrow is that there, the inner choroid is still where we find it in vivo, not on autopsy. And so this relates even today as COVID is clearly devastated and we try to recover this here and obviously it's hit countries also like India extremely hard. Ophthalmology, we're in a very particular um, uh, sensitive situation with our patients where ophthalmologists are in our close proximity. We've shown that we're at higher risk of transmitting diseases like COVID. Now this does not obviate the necessity of an exam ever, but it just goes to show that when we do these exams, 
something like an eye exam is not necessarily always trivial. You know, there's always risks to everything that we do and minimizing things that may have potential harm are important to recognize. And so this is what led to three of our institutions here in the States to stop this screening practice. And this is part of the paradigm of de-adoption in terms of um, harmful or less useful practices. So overuse and misuse. And so the British were ahead of us and they actually implemented this and doing it on an exceptional case by case basis. So again, um, it's exceedingly rare in this setting. And the important thing is treating the underlying cause. Ophthalmologic screen intervention may lead to more harm. And really we should be doing a targeted approach based on the, looking at the entire clinical picture. Thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Mark. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Professor Atul. Um, are there any questions for Dr. Mark? Yeah, I was just wondering, Mark, uh, do you think this, uh, you're seeing some candida post-COVID endophthalmitis, do you think it's related to the COVID or it's just their, uh, their immunosuppressed or is it directly related to the COVID or it's because yeah. they're immunosuppressed or? It's a great question. Um, yeah, there was a really great paper that came out of India regarding those cases of Canada and fungal anthelmitis following the COVID. And it seemed that they were very immunosuppressed with the corticosteroids as well. So I think that sort of predisposed them to getting that, you know, Canada and fungal bloodstream infection, which then seeded into the eye. And that's really the take home point here is that really treating the underlying cause of the problem, which is the bloodstream infection itself, and recognizing these catheters are immediately exchanged or removed as soon as we can. The candida loves to grow on, on these catheters yeah, and they you. form these really intense biofilms and it's really a travesty if we can't get those treated. And there's another thing, uh, would you prefer a, a primary vitrectomy for a candida or a fungal endophthalmitis or would you like to give like the post cataract endophthalmitis uh, would you like to give a couple of intravital injections, including amphotericin B in the intravital cavity, and then go in for vitrectomy? Yeah, you... I think I think um, there's there are a lot of new studies now that are showing you know early vitrectomy. I think is a great option um, for many patients. You know, we have smaller gauge instrumentation. We have different antibiotics than back during you know the endophthalmized vitrectomy study days. So I'm not sure how much those results are really uh, applicable to today and. It would be great if we had another randomized control trial since then to really update the way we we um, you know manage these cases. And you know, in surgery and other surgical disciplines, it's all about draining the abscess, right? When you have an abscess, you drain it. And so um, it is interesting. You know, tap and inject is you know appropriate for sure in certain cases. But I think vitrectomy is having more and more of a role. That's right. So we every, we are all still banking on the EVS till now, trying to extrapolate the EVS results onto endophthalmitis, endogenous. So. Yeah, it, it's a tough. It was it was a little bit of a stretch there, and that's why I was trying to qualify that because you know obviously that relates to anterior segment surgery that's a little bit different, and we're dealing with bacteria and yeah. whatnot. But it's hard because we don't really have that sort of randomized trial with endogenous fungal endophthalmitis because it's so it is so rare here. Um, you know, I'm sure with Indian experience may be quite different. Um, yeah. So thanks. It was a beautiful lecture. Very nice. Very, uh, made us aware of a lot of things about endogenous endophthalmitis and it's, uh, it is common in India and, uh, it's the indwelling catheters or, uh, uh, partly sterilized, uh, IV lines or people, people who are nimbus press, diabetic. And there are a lot of people who have undergone renal transplants and liver transplants who end up with some kind of a choroiditis, CMV retinitis or endophthalmitis. Because these uh, transplant patients actually uh, get, on, get on to very long immunosuppressive therapy and they start getting retinal problems. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, it's really challenging, like you said, and um, it, might, it might even increase to some extent with how many more right. getting immunocompromised. Diksha ji, uh, I think I just want to tell you my first, my talk was on the first. Where do you want to schedule it? No, sir, we can go ahead with your talk first, sir.
So I'll, I'll just take a moment to invite you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, for the next talk, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Professor Atul Kumar. Professor Atul Kumar is the chief at RP Center of Ophthalmic Sciences and head of uh, Vitro Retinal Services at Ames, New Delhi, India. It's my pleasure and privilege to have uh, Professor Atul Kumar with us today. Over to you, sir. Thank you. So I'm talking on a topic which we all know aware of. It's it's the new breakthrough breakthrough technology after the MIVS, which is using a 3D uh, visualization system for vitreoretinal surgery. And most of you are familiar with this kind of technique and they're probably using it themselves in the ORs in their respective hospitals and medical centers, ophthalmic centers. But here at the RP Center also, the AIMS, we use this since the last about three years, we've been using this uh, ingenuity system with the, uh, uh, which actually gives us high, high definition, uh, high magnification and very good color contrast. And it's also being, being a teaching hospital helps our residents to watch exactly what they, what we do. They also see the same. So th there is a 3D camera and it's a high definition camera. It's, you got a flat panel visualization, which has, uh, which helps you to watch because it's all a pixelized image. It's a digitized image. So unlike analog microscopes, the digitized images can be uh, enlarged in size to a great extent and the magnification afforded is really great of great help. So the OLED screen, 4, uh, 4K OLED screen on which the surgeon views a 3D uses passive polaroid glasses, not the active ones. So you just sit there and look up at the screen, not at the eyepieces because the eyepieces have been taken off and there in fact you have the 3D camera. And uh, so this is just to show you uh, So this is on the screen, you know, this is trying to show live the screen. So that's a constellation making its noise. So we got a dabbing vitrectomy in which we try to cut through with a 27 gauge cutter. So the 27 gauge cutter is also lifts up the tissue as well as it's got a multifunction level and also cuts. So make sure it doesn't cause breaks. And uh, we had an exten extensive layer of fibrovascular proliferation. This is done about a week back. So I picked up this fresh uh, videotape. So this is just a short clip I wanted to show. So what has happened is the, uh, the ingenuity and the constellation can be fused together and you can have all the data including the IOP, the cut rate and the vacuum, everything on the ingenuity screen on the sides and that's what's called data fusion you got a lot of ergonomics because you look you we sit back we don't peek peep into the microscope eyepieces so uh, that's the way it is straight back look at the screen and uh, tone we, we normally use much less light as compared to the analog viewing through a microscope and uh, this is something i've noticed that the light uses much less so less chance of Photic or photo, uh, phototoxic, phototoxicity of the macula. Light exposure is also less because of that. The di digital, as I told you, digitized images can be really uh, magnified and it will, you can pick up tiny uh, breaks or something which I'm sure may be missed, may, may not be missed, but in the analog routine microscopes. So I've seen a whole lot of such findings over my three, four years of experience using the a 3D uh, Ingenuity machine, uh, Ingenuity, uh, it's a viewing system along with the constellation. So, so this is just showing you a diabetic vitrectomy with a with a magnified view, and uh, because the view is so magnified, you can exactly know the plane of your surgery and the dissection. Because it's important to know the plane. If you're not in the correct plane, you actually may create breaks or more bleeders or 
uh, if you know the correct plane and you can pick up the posterior hyaloid as well as the fibrovascular proliferative tissue so here it wasn't so densely adherent so i'm just trying to show you that uh, in generally uh, vr viewing system really helps you to identify the planes and this was the post operative result and the quality of image is extremely good it's natural tissue color it's no art it's no pseudo color like you get the optos or which are wide wide field images which you get in many other systems but this uh, interoperative live you get two two color pictures and there's uh, that's a big advantage you know, you know exactly the color of the retina the what are the spots which are abnormal so abhi we written a paper about it so also because you're looking at the distance about 3 feet away so you don't get that asynopia and too much of accommodation when you're doing vr surgery which takes longer so this is just to show you uh, vitromacular traction surgery so here also we find that uh, we're using a wide angle viewing system here initially to and uh, you know squirting some uh, dilute transcendolone to identify the posterior hyaloid uh, this transcendolone really helps you can actually then lift up the posterior hyaloid with either forceps which may be actually traumatic or you can use the suction of the cutter and uh, depending on the ease with which you can do uh, the procedure as long as you don't create any retinal damage or trauma you need to pick up the posterior hyaloid well and go tangentially because if, if you go anterior posteriorly you may create a break action so that should be avoided so this way the ioct uh, the we have the ioct with it so the ioct guidance helps you to make sure that you not created a macular hole so we'll relieve the via vitro macular traction and the retina is intact so once you not created a hole in the vmt you sure that your surgery is being okay so the other advantages are the filters are there and the filters will actually tell us in future how well we can see the vitreous and also to stain the ilm maybe we don't need to stain with the dye we just the filter itself kind of color colors the macula the the ilm and you can peel the ilm well i'm not so good that that i used still use the ilm blue or the brilliant blue g dye uh, in india so this is one last video i'm trying to show you which is done few weeks back and this is a, a a giant tear with the inferior giant tear with a temporal tear and with a with some degree of pvr fixed folds so here we can see that the the amount of magnification you get and the amount of clarity you get with the wide angle viewing system with the with the ingenuity is something that uh, is amazing and the periphery i can see so well and uh, it's not that the center is visual, uh, visualized as many of the authors have read talk about the center but the periphery is beautifully visualized you can see the peripheries and the the lot of retinal cysts in the red, in the is multiple retinal cysts which of course we going to wait because they normally disappear so this will old detachment with lot of retinal cysts and so we got the retina to flatten out and put oil inside and uh, we trimmed the edges because the edges were rolled out rolled up so we got to trim these edges because and get the pfc across go beyond the uh, edges of the giant tear before you put the laser so so anyway he did well and uh, thank you so much i hope i'm well in time any questions very well in time thank you so much uh, dr atul kumar uh, any questions from the team great talk uh just wondering with your giant retinal tear repair do you do a direct uh pfo to oil yes. exchange or okay pfo you, so you don't do air exchange yeah. Yeah, i broke my fingers by doing air exchange in between but now i'm dead sure i do pfo i bring the pfo right up till the uh, beyond the flaps and then do a direct oil exchange with the chandelier illumination are there any cases that you would not use a 3d visualization system for i don't think so <laughs> i do all my cases in the 3d visualization so i think i've got a hook to it i yeah, feel i like think we do everything with it you know i think we're getting more comfortable because initially there were some thoughts for you know media issues and pupil issues and things like that might be a factor but i think you get more used to getting the best out of the system agree with you dilraj
Dr. Ochoa, that, that was a wonderful talk. How often do you think the OCT is valuable to you? You know, we always sort of think about, do we need to incorporate OCT? Should we just be double staining to identify ERM and ILM? Uh, does that lower your, uh, your need to do double staining? It's getting a lot of myopics, pathological myops, in which you've got to identify with absolutely no contrast the macular hole at the table. And also to be sure that after you put the ILM flaps, the holes are closed. Also that we've not created any hydrogenic breaks. And like I just did a surgery recently, a diabetic uh, fibrovascular proliferation, we peeled off the membranes. We wanted to be sure because the macula was very, very thin. We wanted to be sure there was no break in the macula. So we want, we just scanned the center and we were, it reassures you that yes, and then you also are sure you not don't want to peel an ILM in a very thin retina, which is cystic in a diabetic. Another thing is, is many of these pathological myop RDs which we get, the myopic macular hole RDs, they contain a my, my, macular hole, which is not picked up preoperatively. And the interoperative phase, the IOCT guidance gives me a, a, a great amount of information that yes, there is a hole. I may do a very good myopic macular, macular uh, myopic detachment, mm -hmm. but if I don't treat the macular hole, I think that'll be a failure. So the IOCT is a big, I think it, for me, it's a big advantage to be there. And I use it often. What about, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I used to use it a lot. Uh, we haven't found a great way to monetize its, its use. And so therefore we, we, we don't have uh, the intraoperative OCT built in uh, right now. Um, so certainly that's something we're considering and I frequently end up double staining, uh, especially in high myopes uh, to identify that and using sort of uh, gas more frequently to sort of prevent against the iatrogenic break and the iatrogenic hole. I know uh, Dr. Gruel, uh, you know, you, you guys at Duke, you use it uh, frequently. Are you using it on all of your cases at this point? No, it, it becomes a little challenging to use it in every single case. Uh, you know, part of it is time constraint, especially if you're trying to um, do it as part of your study. Uh, there is a setup time to it. I think that in the cases like Professor Atul, like you mentioned, those are really helpful. Uh, diabetics, it's been quite helpful to identify uh, membranes. But uh, I agree with you, Yasha. I think the, the you know, financial aspect is a, is a key issue here because it's hard to justify the capital purchase beyond larger institutions. And secondly, it does have a learning curve and there is some additional time that it adds on to the surgery too. So for all comers, I, it may not be required or particularly helpful, but I think in select macular cases, and as we get better into looking in the retinal periphery, that's something that we've been trying to work on. I think that's another untapped area for intraop OCT, you know, to look at being able to distinguish some of the peripheral pathology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Dr. Tool showed some really wonderful cases where it adds significant value for sure. So. Yeah. So the financial aspect is definitely a factor which is against it. So. Yeah, beautiful surgeries. Very well done. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Atul. Moving on to the next speaker, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Ali Khan. Dr. Ali Khan is Assistant Professor at Kimmel Medical College and an attending surgeon at Will's Eye Hospital Retina Service. Can we have the presentation, please? Good morning, everyone. My name is Ali Khan. I'm a member of the retina service at Wells Eye Hospital, and I'm happy to present to you this morning regarding outcomes of epiretinal membrane surgery and OCT biomarkers of visual acuity. I have no financial disclosures. And the objectives today are to discuss an OCT-based criteria to grade and characterize epiretinal membranes and identify OCT-based biomarkers of visual outcomes in eyes undergoing epiretinal membrane surgery. So as we all know, the most common type of fibrovascular proliferation at the vitroretinal interface is an epiretinal membrane. The pathophysiology is still not completely understood, but may involve hyalocyte proliferation in the setting of an anomalous posterior vitreous detachment. Vitrectomy and membrane peeling remains the standard of care for visually significant epiretinal membranes. However, visual recovery can be variable. 
depending person to person and from IDI. Here's an example of a clear epiretinal membrane on a fundus photograph with distortion of the foveal anatomy and clear retinal striae. We know from clinical track practice that all epiretinal membranes are not created equal. Some might be mild with preservation of the foveal depression, while others might be more severe with other findings such as cystic uh, intraretinal changes. So what do we consider when we consider surgery? Visual acuity. In the United States, the 2040 uh, line on the Snellen chart is often used as a standard bearer. The imaging, you know, how does the morphology truly look? And symptoms, particularly metaphorphopsia, is that a prominent part of the chief complaint? Ultimately, when deciding to do surgery, it would be beneficial to have a grading scheme to give a better idea prognostically on how a patient may do post-ERM surgery. In 2017, Govetto et al., including a group out of UCLA, described an SDOCT-based ERM grading scheme, and this is easily completed in the office with a standard OCT and does not require any additional software or post-image processing. The grading scheme is as follows. Stage one is described as an ERM with preservation of the foveal depression, while stage two, there's loss of the foveal depression. Stage three and stage four are defined by what we call an ectopic interfoveal layer, which is denoted by the white arrows. In stage three, there is an ectopic interfoveal layer, or EIFL, but all retinal layers are still easily identifiable. On stage four, there's an EIFL, but the retinal layers are no longer easily identifiable. There are additional biomarkers, particularly inner microcystoid changes, which are cystic changes in the inner retina, as well as ellipsoid zone disruption, which we're more familiar with. So we looked at, retrospectively, outcomes of 322 eyes undergoing idiopathic epiretinal membrane surgery at Willesley Hospital. We had very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, so any concurrent retinal or macular disease, including other conditions such as glaucoma or corneal disease, were excluded, and the minimum follow-up was six months. We looked at OCT biomarkers uh, in particular to assess if they could predict visual outcomes post-surgery. Here is a video of a standard epiretinal membrane surgery at our institution. The vitrectomy is completed, followed by installation of dilute endocyanin green or ICG. ICG is uh, you know, quickly irrigated out, and you can see very nicely uh, some negative stain from an epiretinal membrane, but also uh, some nice green stain from the internal lumbar membrane. Using 23, 25, or 27 gauge island forceps, the internal limiting membrane and ERM are peeled in a broad based fashion, not necessarily fully arcade to arcade, but as broad as we think is necessary. And in as little of a uh, uh, traumatic fashion as possible, we peel the membranes off, um, hopefully in one sheet as shown here. So we looked at outcomes based uh, upon the ERM stage as well as the overall cohort. Preoperatively, we found that higher ERM stages were associated with worse visual acuity. The overall visual acuity at baseline was 2060, which improved statistically significant fashion to 2040 at final follow-up. We noticed that the greatest improvement in vision was noted in stage three and stage four uh, eyes, which uh, you know, makes sense as stage one and stage two may have had a ceiling effect on their visual acuity. While stage one did not have a significant improvement in visual acuity, this might be um, underestimating the improvement gain in symptoms such as metamorphopsia, which were not objectively assessed. We looked in a multivariate analysis of OCT features that were predictive of visual acuity at six months in a final follow-up. We found that inner microcystoid changes and ellipsoid zone disruption present at post-operative month three were associated with worse vision at six months and a final follow-up. So again, these are post-operative presence of these biomarkers, but they were significantly associated in multivariate analysis for both six months and at final follow-up. So while the ERM grade alone did not predict visual outcomes, these two OCT biomarkers did seem to do so. Here are some representative examples of stage one, two, three, and four ERMs preoperatively and postoperatively with you know, significant improvement in the foveal contour and visual acuity. We assessed the ability to achieve 2040 vision or better. We found that ultimately greater than 80% of eyes in stage one and two achieved 2040 vision and, or better compared to 70% in stage three and under 50% in stage four. So while we did notice a significant improvement in vision in stage three and four ERMs, the ultimate uh, ability to achieve 2040 vision was still higher in eyes with stage one and stage two, which brings up the concept of surgical timing. You know, should we really wait until stage two or 
advocacy. Sorry, should we really wait until stage three or stage four if ultimately they're less able to achieve 2040 vision? We did an initial analysis in eyes with concurrent glaucoma. The Govetto et al. group had noted in a previous study that inner microcystoid changes were more common in eyes with glaucoma than in eyes without. We compared 114 eyes with glaucoma and ERM to an age, gender, and baseline vision match controlled uh, group of 139 eyes with idiopathic epiretinal membrane. While baseline visual acuity was similar between groups, eyes with glaucoma did have worse final visual acuity. And interestingly, the presence of intermicrocystoid changes was significantly higher preoperatively and postoperatively. So why would intermicrocystic changes be associated with worse visual acuity? We think this might be closely related to Mueller cell viability. The internuclear layer contains structures that are crucial in maintaining retinal homeostasis, including the body of Mueller cells and tractional forces from the epiretinal membrane may be further stressing in Mueller cells. This may be uh, especially important in surgical decision-making where stripping of internal limbing membrane may also be detrimental to Mueller cells. So potentially interesting uh, topic to look into and further study. So some take-home points in the described OCT grading scheme, higher ERM stages were associated with worse visual acuity. Uh, at the preoperative visit, across all eyes, visual acuity improved after uh, vitrectomy and membrane peeling. However, eyes with stage one and stage two characteristics were more likely to achieve 2040 vision at final follow-up. Inner microcystoid changes and ellipsoidoid disruption on postoperative month three OCT scans were negatively associated with later time points in terms of six months and final visual acuity. I'd like to thank our research team, particularly uh, Razia and Atta, our research fellows, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you this morning. A big thank you to Dr. Ali for the wonderful session. Um, any questions you may want to discuss, uh, gentlemen? So this, this video was a pre-recorded session. So in case there are any questions, uh, we can discuss uh, here right away amongst ourselves. Uh, Yasha and uh, uh, Raj, do you feel this break in the ellipsoid and ORTs and all contribute to the poor visual acuity results after ERM surgery, thin macula? Yeah, so certainly I think that any time where we have ellipsoid zone changes, I, I think that's obviously going to portend a very poor prognosis. But with that said, the work of David Seraf has uh, really sort of defined what is called the Sonova sign or the cotton ball sign, where there's essentially some degree of anterior posterior traction on the retina. Um, yeah. And that sort of is a good window to intervene. So in addition to the uh, classification by Gervetto, which I also use in my practice, I think identification of ectopic inner retinal layers and that sort of synova sign are really excellent metrics for me to want to intervene surgically. Um, I sort of found it interesting that there were even patients who had surgery in stage one in the, in the Will series, because those yep. are frequently patients who are completely asymptomatic. I'd be very curious as to what both of you do. At stage one, or I wouldn't. I would generally don't operate. The grade zero, grade one, I don't operate. I generally because they're very mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, so I don't like to operate those cases and just keep them on a regular follow up, regular check. I, I agree completely. I think the only exception to that might be eyes where the fellow eye has had a similar kind of a process that has rapidly progressed. And if you're starting to see some changes, um, anatomical changes that might warrant earlier intervention in such eyes, but um, otherwise using these, you know, biomarkers, it's, it's, it's really helpful in terms of predicting outcomes. And it doesn't negate the fact that you have to counsel patients that the recovery process is long. It may take up to a year I, before you know. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm not quick. I, I, prefer not to operate on patients that are asymptomatic either. I mean, a lot of these epiretinal membranes can sometimes improve a little bit on their own, not That's infrequently. Right. And, right. Um, you know, sometimes even rarely, you've actually seen them resolve, you know, and so right. that's obviously not a common occurrence, but um, while these biomarkers are really helpful and it's really exciting how we're able to image and see these things, I think a lot of it comes back to the patient that's in front of you and what they're dealing with and how it affects their life. Completely agree with you, Mark. 
Sorry, what was that? I said completely agree with you. Oh, completely agree. Oh, yes. Thanks. Sometimes you watch and wait the ELMs kind of, you know, just clean, clean up, they kind of roll out and uh, the, the patients improve, the patient improves. So you don't need to tackle every ERM which is thin, like a cellophane maclopathy. So cellophane maclopathy is a very fine membrane and so probably you can just leave them alone and for, we have them on the serial follow-up. Yeah, I agree with you there too. Great. So moving on to the next session, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Rachel. Dr. Rachel, may I please request you uh, to unmute your lines? Thank you. Dr. Rachel is Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology and Director of Inherited Retinal Disorders. Uh, she is doing fellowship at Director of Inherited Retinal Disorders. Over to you, Dr. Rachel. Thank you. I will start sharing my screen. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak with you today um, and talk about what's happening currently in the, in the efforts to develop genetic therapies for inherited retinal disorders. My disclosures are primarily related to clinical trial involvement. And you know we're, we're taking a, a different direction than the prior talks. And let's just stop and remind ourselves what we are talking about when we talk about inherited retinal disorders or IRDs. These are conditions where uh, mutations in a single gene are, um, are sufficient to cause disease in a given individual. And that's in contrast to conditions like age-related macular degeneration where genetics are certainly a, uh, a contributing factor, but it's not as simple as, as one-to-one. There's over 260 genes that can cause IRDs, and this genetic diversity is accompanied by clinical diversity. As you all know from seeing um, a patient with Stargardt disease versus a patient with retinitis pigmentosa. But what really unifies this set of conditions is the devastating impact they can have on vision and our inability to uh, treat the patients that we see with them. There have been uh, significant advances um, towards treatment just in the last 30 years though. It was really only in 1990 that the first uh, genes causing IRDs were uh, started to be developed or recognized rather. And that type of information laid the found foundation for developing gene specific treatments and some of those treatments getting into clinical trials. And then in 2017, the first gene therapy success story with the approval of the gene therapy Luxturna by the US Food and Drug Administration. We still continue to have new tools entering our toolbox though. Um, so CRISPR-Cas genome editing really entered the scientific world as a therapeutic tool um, less than a decade ago. And it's something that we already have um, we're already using in clinical trials. And, and so with this backdrop, you know, where are we today in 2021? And I'd like to answer that question by reviewing the, the following topics. So first we'll talk about the mechanics of Luxturna just as a model for how um, adeno-associated virus or AAV-based subretinal gene therapies work. We'll talk about the ongoing trials um, using this approach and, and a few of the take-home points that we're learning so far. We'll also turn to alternative gene-specific strategies when AAV-based replacement doesn't work. And then we'll finish with um, some of the challenges and opportunities that uh, we hope to tackle in the years ahead. So we'll start with Luxturna um, and that these graphics do a nice job of reminding us all how gene therapies work. Um, so we primarily use adeno-associated viruses or AAVs, and they are um, modified so that all they're carrying is the gene of interest. And so for Luxturna, of course, that's the sequence for the gene RPE65. During a pars plana vitrectomy, um, a small volume of that gene therapy, so typically up to 300 microliters, is injected underneath the retina and the macula to create a subretinal blub. And that, that uh, subretinal injection, it's quite important because it puts the gene therapy and the virus in physical proximity with the cells of interest. Um, and so for RPE65 and Luxturna gene therapy, that's the retinal pigment epithelium. For some of the other trials, uh, other genes in clinical trials, that's the rods and cones. The virus then does its job as a virus, it infects or transduces the cells of interest and delivers the, the gene of interest. 
And when the virus gets into the, the cell type of interest, it delivers the DNA to the nucleus of that cell. A feature of adeno-associated viruses is that the DNA that's delivered does not enter the host chromosome um, or genome. Instead, it sits outside the chromosomes as a circular piece of DNA, but its presence in the nucleus enables the production of the, the protein from that gene. And in the case of RPE65, related disease, um, the expression restores the visual cycle. And this type of model um, really forms the basis for many of the trials that are underway. So now in 2021, there are um, at least eight genes that are being approached with this AAV-based subretinal gene therapy strategy in clinical trials. And these range from early, one, uh, early phase one, two efforts, all the way to conditions like choroideremia, that are well into phase three trials and X-linked retinitis pigmentosa due to the RPGR gene that are starting to enter phase three trials or getting there soon. Rather than focusing on you know, each of these trials individually, what I'd like to talk about is what are we learning from them? And I'm gonna focus on um, two points, one related to safety and one related to efficacy. So I think on the whole, um, the, the favorable safety profile that we saw come out of the early work with Luxterna um, is being substantiated by the ongoing efforts across that list that I just showed you. And for my, my surgical colleagues, um, they might think that choroideremia is one of the most challenging conditions in which to do these subretinal gene therapies due to the fragility of the retina. And in this fundus photo and the accompanying OCT, um, you see images from one of my own patients with choroideremia, and I'm sure you appreciate how thin the retina gets as we leave the fovea and um, can anticipate the challenges of um, safely delivering a subretinal blood to that area. Even here though, we have mounting clinical data um, really supporting that these gene therapies can be delivered safely with good visual recovery. So these graphs you see um, are from four patients that were treated in the Biogen-sponsored trial of uh, choroideremia gene therapy. And in the weeks after surgery, their treated eyes, which are indicated by the asterisks, had a very nice recovery um, back to baseline. And the same kind of recovery process has been um, shown with other types of visual function modalities, including microperimetry. Another aspect of safety um, is inflammation. So does introducing the adeno-associated virus into the subretinal space um, create any safety challenges of its own? And while we know to anticipate inflammation and um, you know, go on the offense and treat it in advance, um, that should not be something that and other types of AAV-related safety issues should not be something that limit us um, in, in, the retinal, uh, in the retinal space. Second, I think um, a maybe surprising um, take home from some of these trials is that rescue of degenerating areas of retina may, may be possible. So my hope was certainly that if we delivered um, gene therapy to functioning photoreceptors in these hereditary conditions, that we could stabilize their function and, and protect that, that contribution to vision over time. But it may be for that some of these conditions, we can also rescue the function of degenerating photoreceptors that um, aren't as functional as we would like. And so this data comes from um, an early publication coming from another Biogen trial, this time um, gene therapy for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa due to the RPGR gene. And it highlights microperimetry results for three patients. Um, they had quite good visual acuity to start with. Um, but as you can see in the baseline microperimetry on the left, uh, very limited macular responses after, after we leave the fovea. And in the month after, um, after gene therapy, all of these patients have an expansion of this area of sensitivity um, and an increase in their mean sensitivity. And for two of these patients, that is clearly maintained um, six months after therapy. In contrast, their untreated eyes didn't change from baseline and remain stable. And again, I, if, I, if I think about my own patients who might have microperimetry that look like this at baseline, um, once we get out of the, the red or sensitive area, uh, we've, we've started to lose a lot of structure on OCT. So you know, we're, we're at a point where the um, photoreceptor bands become hard to resolve. So this was certainly 
um, a, a remarkable and exciting result. And the other two companies conducting phase one to RPGR gene therapy trials have shown something similar. Um, so as a field, we hope that uh, we see more of this in the upcoming phase three trials. But let's come back to this list I started with, um, because even as I think it represents a very impressive step forward in developing treatments for IRDs, I think it's also important to focus on what's missing. Um, and so, you know, here are eight genes. I told you that 260 uh, genes at least are implicated in IRDs. And there are many genes missing from this list where the size of the gene, the mechanism of disease and factors like that make, that make the genes amenable to the same type of AAV-based AAV gene replacement strategy. Some genes are either too large to fit into the AAV or the mode of uh, the mechanism of disease is such that just replacing the gene isn't effective. Um, and so this won't be an approach that works for all genes and all diseases. So what are our alternatives? And I'd like to focus on two, um, two that are currently in clinical trials. One of them, genome editing using the CRISPR-Cas9 system, um, still works at the DNA level, but rather than uh, replacing a copy of a gene in its entirety, um, works on editing what's there. And I see I'm out of time, so I'm gonna go quickly here. The other type of approach, um, antisense oligonucleotides or AONs, works at an RNA level. And so um, uh, it's not a permanent treatment. And again, both of these types of trials, our strategies are in clinical trials. We're getting some nice head-to-head -head comparisons of their efficacy. And then looking forward, I think challenges for all of us are developing methods that let us treat earlier in disease and still um, you know, access the entirety of the retina rather than the macula. You see these pictures of my patients where I would love to have um, treatments to rescue their, their still pretty healthy far peripheral retinas. Um, we need efficiency um, so that even with these mutation specific treatments, we can um, work quickly to bring treatments to these patients. And we may need to also look beyond specific gene-based therapies. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak and uh, thank the great team that I get to work with at Mass Pioneer. Excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Rachel. Thank you, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are running short of time, so we can take all the questions post the talks. So moving forward, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Yasha Modi, he is Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology and his present affiliation is with New York University, New York. Over to you, Dr. Yasha. Great, thank you so much for the invite. It's been some very, very fascinating talks here. I'm just gonna share my screen and I'm gonna talk about something a little bit more boring, maybe something a bit more mundane. And this is diabetic macular edema and uh, sort of when to observe this, when to treat this because this affects every single retina specialist. And uh, these are my financial disclosures of note. I am a consultant for Genentech, but we won't speak on anything specific about anti-VEGF therapy. Uh, and so when we think about treating in diabetic macular edema, really clinical trials have shaped our decision making, and the thresholds have really been divided by visual acuity. So for 2032 to 2400 diabetic macular edema, most clinical trials cover this, and they definitely, the, you know, we know that we need to treat all of these patients. For Count Fingers diabetic macular edema, we have less evidence as they were excluded from clinical trials, but real world studies show that they have significant benefit from treatment. For 2020 to 2025 DME, we have excellent data from protocol B and I'd like to spend the majority of our time talking about that. And then also prophylaxis of DME, we now have excellent data from protocol S and protocol W. And so we've seen the famous rise and ride data that we're, and this is something that we see all too often at meetings and we learned two major take home messages. One is that anti-VEGF works very rapidly in the first three months and that we shouldn't delay treatment for patients with 2040 or worse vision because if we do, they never fully recover to their potential. So the lessons that we've learned from over the last 15 years is that OCT is the gold standard for measurement and we use center involving DME. All anti-VEGFs work for the treatment of diabetic macular edema with 2032 or worse vision. And some anti-VEGFs may be better than others. And we won't talk really about protocol T at this point, but I think we're all familiar with this data. 
And that steroids also work well, but there are more side effects and therefore they're relegated to second line. And delaying treatment is uniformly bad. So just think about this patient. This is a 48 year old woman. She's got blurred vision for six weeks. And these are the plethora of treatment options available to you. So what would you do in this situation? And does it change if I tell you that her visual acuity is 2020 minus at presentation? And so based on our initial intuition and from our prior diabetic macular edema studies, we realized that deferring treatment resulted in suboptimal visual recovery. And this is sort of the basis and development of protocol B when evaluating patients with diabetic macular edema and excellent visual acuity. Now think about the ETDRS for one moment. 40% of eyes in the ETDRS had best corrected visual acuity of 2020. So this has significant health and uh, public health implications. So in 2019, we finally have level one evidence sort of looking at this. And this was a sort of a systematic approach for the management of patients with diabetic macular edema with either 2020 or 2025 vision. And it's critical to realize what the study did not evaluate. This was not a study looking at a flippercept monotherapy versus laser monotherapy versus observation. Rather, this was a systematic initial approach to the patients with good visual acuity and appropriate rescue strategies. So this was about 200 plus patients in each arm looking at prompt anti-VEGF therapy, prompt laser versus deferred anti-VEGF therapy, and observation versus deferred anti-VEGF therapy. And the primary outcome was unique in that it was a percentage of eyes that lost five letters of visual acuity at two years. Because remember, there's a ceiling effect when we're looking at patients with excellent visual acuity. And the secondary outcome was mean best corrective visual acuity at two years. So let's cut to the chase here. There were no differences between groups when evaluating best corrective visual acuity at two years, and that the mean best corrective visual acuity at baseline and year two of follow-up was 2020 across all three arms. And there were no changes in central retinal thickness across the three groups. And surprisingly, the central retinal thickness declined over the course of two years across all three groups. So we now realize that eyes with center involving DME and good visual acuity can be observed unless visual acuity worsens. So then the real question is, how do we apply this to our patients and how do we prevent notoriously worse outcomes in the real world? So as I was reading the protocol V study, a couple of questions came to mind. When and how often do they treat patients? How did they extend patients that they were being observed? And how do I do that in my own clinic? How many times were they seen and how many total injections did patients receive in years one and two? So I think we have to kind of go into a little bit of the details here. So first, when we think about that flipper set group, these patients received monthly treatment for the first six months. And then the decision to treat subsequently was they either was a change from equilibrium. If they had either a five letter visual acuity increase or decrease or their central subfield thickness either increased or they decreased by 10%, they were retreated. And they were slowly extended to eight and 16 weeks if their visual acuity was stable for three consecutive visits and focal laser was possible. So mean number of injections, and think about this in your own clinic, six injections in the first year, 2.4 injections in the second year. And this is dramatically different from prior anti-VEGF studies looking at 20-40 vision or worse. Now, how about the laser and observation extent? So this is what I call sort of the observe and extend window. They were followed initially every two months and then extended to four months if they were stable. And the rationale for treatment decisions was if their visual acuity dec declined by greater than 10 letters at any visit or five to nine letters at two consecutive visits, they were retreated. So a couple of things that we learned. First, the number of retreatments is uh, the number of people who needed rescue therapy was about a third in the observation group and a quarter in the laser group. And so we now know that there is a de demonstrates a treatment benefit of focal laser. This is sort of one of those forgotten about topics in anti-VEGF or in diabetic macular edema, but there is a treatment reduction burden in patients getting focal laser. And then also we realized that patients, while they need a few rescue treatments, we need close follow-up to be able to determine which patients require those injections. And the number of visits required was approximately on average six visits per year at least. So then the question, does protocol be applied to patients who are symptomatic? What about patients with horrible levels of glycemic control? And what about eyes with proliferative diabetic retinopathy? So on average, baseline characteristics, 
20 or better visual acuity applied to two thirds of patients. And the mean central subfield thickness was really quite thin at about 311 microns. But realized that 50% of patients were symptomatic. And this was quite surprising to me. And they realized that it's reasonable to closely observe patients even when they are symptomatic with diabetic macular edema. So what about their hemoglobin A1Cs? On average, it was 7.6 but there was certainly a range from 6.6 .6 to 9.1. So while we really think that we can apply this to a wide variety of patients with hemoglobin A1Cs, just be aware that for patients who are outliers, this may not be the right patient population to extrapolate from. And what about eyes with proliferative diabetic retinopathy? Well, this is only four to 8% of patients with PDR in the protocol V. And the current treatment options, as we know, is complicated and we all argue a lot about this. PRP versus anti-VEGF therapy versus some sort of combination of both. And really in this study, there were a low number of patients to guide treatments. We know that it's unacceptable to observe, and that really gives us a combination option, anti-VEGF alone or PRP alone. And really protocol V provides little guidance on the management of patients with DME and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So we have to use our best judgment. So DME when we think about patients with 2020 or 2025 vision, we have excellent evidence from protocol V. It's reasonable to observe initially, but we must follow these patients closely. And protocol V provides a practical framework that I use in my practice to follow my patients. And of course, many questions remain. What about DME prophylaxis? Now, this is sort of a hot topic in the US. And uh, we learned that from protocol S, which was a comparative study for patients with PDR receiving either PRP or anti-VEGF therapy, the cumulative probably, probability of developing vision impairing DME was less in patients who were receiving ranibizumab, about 20% in the ranibizumab group and 38% in the PRP group. And so certainly there's a reduction in the rate of DME when patients are receiving regular anti-VEGF therapy, but the caveat is that visual acuity was the same between groups at five years and realized that patients in the PRP arm also were able to receive anti-VEGF therapy. So it certainly is reasonable to wait until visually disruptive DME develops. And now recent data from protocol W demonstrates a similar finding in patients with moderate to severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And the premise of this study was treating with anti-VEGF therapy to identify what were the rates of preventing vision impairing disease. And that was defined as proliferative diabetic retinopathy or center involving diabetic macular edema. So the two year probability of developing center involving DME or vision loss from BDR was 16% in those receiving aflipercept versus 43% in sham. So a significant reduction in the rates of severe complications. And for PDR, 13% develop PDR in the aflipercept arm and 33% in the sham arm. But notice there was no difference in mean change in visual acuity from baseline to two years. So my best evidence approach to DME is visual acuity at presentation guides my decision making. 20, 30 or worse vision, I treat everybody and I start with anti-VEGF therapy. Remember, we don't use ETDRS testing. Uh, and 2020 to 2025 vision, I observe these patients closely and I use protocol V guidelines to help me in terms of making these decisions. And there's no indication in my practice to prevent DME with anti-VEGF at the moment. So I'm happy to take any questions. I'd love to hear what various treatment patterns and paradigms people are using. And thank you for your time. Excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Yasha. Uh, since we are running short of time, we'll quickly move to the next presenter and then we can come back uh, for the questions. I would now take the honor to invite our next speaker, Dr. Catherine. She's Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at Cole Eye Institute, Cleveland Clinic. May I please request the AV team to start the video? Thank you. Hi there. Hi there. And I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this virtual conference. I'll be speaking about some work that I've done with my colleagues at Cole Eye Institute, including my mentor, Dr. Justice Ehlers, on intraoperative OCT and three-dimensional viewing systems. Some of the funding related to this project came from an ISC with Alcon. Although there has been significant advances in vitro-retinal surgery over the past decade, including with the advent of smaller gauge instrumentation and increasing the cutter weight, visualization with a standard operating microscope has been relatively stagnant in its evolution. 
three-dimensional heads-up display offers a step forward. It provides a digital stereoscopic view of the surgical field on a high-definition monitor. It helps free the surgeon from the confines of the microscope eyepieces and may offer benefits in terms of ergonomics and efficiency. When I was a fellow at Wills, we looked at comparing three-dimensional heads-up display to a standard operating microscope for macular surgery. This was a prospective unmasked randomized clinical trial looking at 39 patients who were having macular surgery for either an epiretinal membrane or a macular hole. We found that the 3D heads-up display required less endoillumination, but ease of use and the peel time was still significantly better with the standard operating microscope. This points to potential benefits of the 3D heads-up display, but also showcases that, that there are still some limitations. Another innovation in terms of um, uh, surgical visualization is that of intraoperative OCT. It can provide a valuable surgical adjuvant to ophthalmic surgery, which can increase our understanding of the pathophysiology of surgical diseases, as well as to provide real-time feedback to the surgeon. Here are some examples that can help to look at the utility of this technology. In this instance of a patient undergoing a macular peel for an epiretinal membrane, real-time OCT imaging can show the traction that's exerted on the retina with, with um, peeling of the epiretinal membrane and can help to give feedback to the surgeon. Another helpful example is subretinal TPA for a submacular hemorrhage. Here you can see that the subretinal placement of the cannula is confirmed, making sure that it is indeed subretinal and not subRPE prior to the TPA being injected. Another instance um, that it can be helpful is actually looking outside of the eye in terms of the creation of scleral windows for a uvial effusion syndrome. Real-time OCT can show the exact tissue depth during the creation of the windows, as well as to also confirm that a sclerotomy was also made. Overall, intraoperative OCT can provide surgeons with additional information on subtle changes in the retina in response to movements being made during surgery. This can help to guide procedures when necessary, but also be able to tell surgeons when um, the goals of the surgery has been achieved. So intraoperative OCT can help lead to a safe and more efficient surgery with improved outcomes. Although these two technologies and innovations have been looked at separately, we were wondering if we could combine them together. For this project, we looked at a comparative assessment of conventionally microscope integrated to digitally enabled intraoperative OCT in the DISCOVER study. Previous studies have supported the, the feasibility and, and usefulness of, of intraoperative OCT, including the DISCOVER study, which is a prospective study that showed a strong surge in preference for visualizing the OCT data on a 2D screen that required looking away from the surgical field compared to using OCT data that's injected into the microscope oculars. This might in part be due to the limited visualization of the OCT when it's injected into the uh, microscope oculars, as well as the fact that those um, images need to be tran transparent. So what this highlighted for us was the need for a new integrative digital surgical theater. We have previously published um, work on integrating interoperative OCT into a three-dimensional heads-up display to really engage with an integrative theater. So the purpose of our project was to compare surgeon experience between conventional microscope integrated interoperative OCT and digitally enabled interoperative OCT with a 3D visualization system in the DISCOVER study. This was a sub-analysis of that study comparing conventional interoperative OCT to digitally enabled interoperative OCT. The IOCT data stream could, could be reviewed by surgical field-based visualization or non-surgical based field um, visualization. And we sought to compare what the perceived utility of intraoperative OCT was, as well as surgical field visualization and efficiency, as well as ergonomics feedback. Um, in order to do this, standardized questionnaires were completed following surgery. Overall, the baseline characteristics were very similar in between our two groups of the conventional interoperative OCT and digitally enabled interoperative OCT, with the most common indication for surgery being that of epiretinal membrane in both groups. There were no interoperative surgical complications that were attributed to interoperative OCT, and the rate of postoperative complications was very similar in between the two groups. We found that 3% uh, of surgeons in the conventional intraoperative OCT group use surgical field-based um, visualization compared to 68% in the um, digitally enabled intraoperative OCT group. Um, both groups found that there was valuable information added by intraoperative OCT in relatively similar amounts, and that was in about 50% of cases. 
Part of the reason that surgeons, um, in terms of surgical field-based visualization of intraoperative OCT, might be a preference is um, based on the layout in the OR. As you can see on the left, when um, the surgeon and the assistant are using surgical field-based visualization, they can look ahead to the screen that they've already um, been watching the surgery on to be able to get more information about the intraoperative OCT. What rather, screen-based visualization requires both the surgeon and the assistant to look away from the microscope in an ergonomically unfriendly position to be able to look at those smaller images on the screen. And accordingly, we found that this um, probably manifested itself in terms of our ergonomic findings. We found that there were significant higher amounts of back discomfort and headache in the conventional intraoperative OCT group. Um, the intraoperative OCT experience was very similar in between the two groups, with the exception of the viewing um, or the rating of the macular view, which was found to be significantly higher um, with surgeons finding this view excellent in the digitally enabled group as compared to the conventional intraoperative OCT group. There are some limitations with this study um, based on, first of all, the person filling out the survey. So the surgeon was the one to fill out the survey in these um, in the study, although they in some cases might have been sitting um, at the scope versus the side scope. And that I think could affect um, their experience during the case. Also, there was a lack of randomization in this um, study. Surgeons needed to include um, cases in both groups in order to be enrolled in the study, but they were not randomized. So what's next? I think really the next thing that's going to help change um, the integration of these two technology is really improving the quality of the interoperative OCT images that are um, 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 placed in the surgical field, as well as to be able to integrate parameters from um, the um, surgical machines, including such as a constellation into the screen to really give that immersive surgical experience. Another example that um, can show what this digitally enabled interoperative experience can be like is by looking at more complicated cases such as this, including a tractional retinal detachment, where we, you can actually move the interoperative OCT pictures to be able to get a better sense of membranes that can really help to guide the movements that we're making to decide when the goals have been achieved of the surgery. And also the integration of um, the parameters from your um, uh, constellation in this case can be very helpful to guide our surgical movements and well as to give real-time feedback to the surgeon. Although we have primarily in this talk really looked at ingenuity as one uh, viewing system, there's more viewing systems that are also coming down the pipeline, which are exciting. One of these is the Artivo system made by Zeiss, which is purported to be the first 3D capable digital ophthalmic microscope, which offers a hybrid mode to allow the surgeon to view the surgical field using 3D imaging on the screen or through the oculars. These images are viewed on a 55 inch 4K resolution screen that comes equipped with interoperative OCT. I'm not sure if anyone in the audience has had an opportunity to use this system, but we've started trialing it at Cole and are actually um, working on a study to compare this to a conventional uh, microscope. And there may be improvements in latency, surgical field color, uh, color needing less endoillumination, as well as increased ease of utilizing the intraoperative OCT. So it'll be an interesting to explore this technology further. In conclusion, intraoperative OCT integration with 3D digital surgical visualization is feasible, and the large screen-based visualization of the OCT data stream minimize the need for an accessory screen utilization. Compared to conventional intraoperative OCT, digitally enabled intraoperative OCT may offer superior ergonomics and increase attention on the surgical field while reviewing those OCTs. However, additional studies are needed to better assess patient outcomes, surgeon experience, and the overall value of integrating technologies to enhance your surgical theater experience. I wanna thank my colleagues at Coli Institute for their help in this project, especially uh, my mentor, Dr. Uh, Justice Sailors, as well as the rest of his lab for their help in this um, project. Thank you so much for your attention. Fantastic presentation by Dr. Catherine. So with this, we come to the end of this session. In case there are any questions, uh, we, can, we can take up one question. We have one minute to start with the next session. So we can probably take up one question for now. I think it was an excellent session. And we had the American speakers were excellent and many of them, uh, you know, they, they, they gave us a lot of new ideas and this kind of ASRS AIOS should have more such sessions where we can inter uh, interact and discuss and 
you know, exchange views and ideas. I was just thinking, Yasha, I wanted to ask one question to Yasha. If you got macular ischemia with uh, DME, how would you approach such a patient? On OCTA, you get macular ischemia, but he's got DME and vision. That, that's right. So, you know, macular schema, the extent of capillary dropout in the foveal avascular zone has a poor correlation on average with visual acuity. And so I think you know, while it's certainly something to recognize that those patients may have a higher treatment burden, uh, I still think that the thresholding of visual acuity can still make those decisions, right? So all of our level one evidence comes in the absence of OCT angiography. And only now are some of the modern studies going back and sort of trying to figure out how does OCTA play a role into our management patients. Uh, I think it's great to realize that there is uh, sort of um, uh, macular ischemia, but it, as a whole, visual acuity may be. Well, thank you to everybody. Thank you for the opportunity for all of us to speak. Uh, you know, the, the collaboration here is wonderful and it's always really great to see surgical videos and, and, and talks from abroad. So we, we really greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here at this meeting. Thanks. Hello, Tom. Yasha. Thank you so much for having us. And um, it's really been a wonderful panel to be share with you guys and uh, look forward to more dissemination of ideas across, you know, from here and in India as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, speakers, for the wonderful uh, session. Uh, it was really a privilege having you all here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.